So the first question was something that we also ran through on um, our IAAC um, exam, which was um, briefly outline the acute management of MH. Um, and then after that, it essentially wants you to um, talk about um, Dantelene pharmacology. When you see briefly outlined, you don't you don't need to write in prose. What they want you to do is just have a stepwise um, process with regards to the acute management of MH. And then the second part of the question is um, Dantelene pharmacology. So when anything sort of talks about uh, pharmacology. Make sure that, that you really think about, you know, pharmaceutics, pharmacokinetics, like those are sort of the key things and on how you would divide your answer. And remember that structure is so important in these, um, in these questions. And, and under pharmacokinetics, always, always put um, side effects. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll show you um, a candidate's answer, how Simon answered uh, his question. So a couple of key points are, if you can see here, what you want, good definition um, of what MH is. And, you know, this is, it's got all the key points here. R1, R1, gene mutations, hypermetabolic state, autosomal dominant. You can see already that there's really a brevity of words here, but because it has the main keywords here, this would score you a point. And, you know, you've got other answers which are a little bit more verbose, and they would score a point too. So what, what I'm trying to say is, you know, even with the brevity of words, as long as you've got the keywords in, you're able to score a point. After that, you've got the, he's got his acute management and, I, and it's already quite nice in terms of how he's done it sort of stepwise, all right? And, and, this, and this is where, um, you know, this is, this, is, this is where you start scoring your points. And it's, very, it's a very sort of nice, easy sort of tick off. So the examiners will, will have like a list of things that they have on their scoring card and, and essentially they'll, they'll just tick off all the ones uh, that you've listed. You've got the main things here, Dantelene, um, ABCD, call for help, switch off volatile, yep, correct. Um, the other thing that you can also add in here is, um, people talk about adding a charcoal filter, 100% O2, hyperventilate, correct, remove offending agents, um, and then all these hyperkalemia, which is good. Uh, temperature, clotting, urine, so urine output, make sure that um, you ensure that uh, they've got a good urine output. Why is it important to make sure, to make sure you, you have a good urine output in, in, in patients with MH? Because of rhabdomyolysis. Yeah, correct. Okay. So you know these um, principles and it's good just to um, put, put that down as well in terms of why you want to make sure that they've got good urine output. Okay. And Monica, CK, yeah. So they get my, myoglobinuria. And then the second part is um, discuss the pharmacology. So again, very good description of the pharmaceutics. Again, broken up into pharmacokinetics, which is really good. I like the way that you've done, you know, distribution, metabolism, excretion. And then after that, pharmacodynamics. So pharmacodynamics, you've, you've uh, described the mechanism of action in more detail, which is good. Um, the only thing missing in pharmacodynamics is the other side effects that you may get with Dantrolene. This is an excellent answer and the only thing that you would expand on would be the dynamics bit. What are some of the other potential dynamic pharmacodynamics of um, Dantrolene? So again, if you struggle, just think about it in terms of broad, um, broad categories. Okay, so When you talk about dynamics, you want you want to make sure that you cover the, sort of the, the the four main or it's really three main core areas: CNS, CVS, respiratory, but also you know you can add GIT as well. So 
CNS. Does it have any CNS effects? You get some central CNS depression. Um, yeah. Stimulation. Correct. So, you know, people get, talk about sedation, drowsiness, confusion. The, um, the pathogenesis is thought to be its disruption with the calcium chemostasis uh, in the brain. You know, how I put sedation, drowsiness, confusion, they're basically describing the same thing. So, I mean, in the interest of time, you could just put sedation and that will score you that, that one mark. Like adding the other bits like drowsiness and confusion, you know, you're still going to get one mark for it. You're not going to get, you're not going to get more than one mark. Just remember that, that, that answering short answer questions, it's, it's a technique. Um, it's that ability to cover concepts with brevity. All right, how about cardiovascular? What, 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 are the, what are some cardiovascular effects? Does it reduce your contractility? Uh, yes, it is thought to reduce contractility, um, although it's going to be mild, okay? I, I, I think it's mostly in, uh, mostly in animal studies. How about any sort of drug interactions that could make the pharmacodynamics worse? Anything that you should avoid giving with dentally? in terms of the cardiovascular drugs. Calcium channel blockers? Yeah, calcium channel blockers, excellent. All right, so you, you want to avoid, it, it's been shown that um, if you use with verapamil, sorry, yeah, it causes hyperkalemia and myocardial depression, all right. Sorry, this is meant to be an arrow. So, so you want to avoid calcium channel blockers. Um, it, and, then, and there's certainly been reports uh, with, the, with its use with verapamil, which is a L-type calcium channel blocker. And what happens is that uh, leads to hyperkalemia and myocardial depression. How about um, respiratory? Skeletal muscle relaxation. And yeah. So of, often, um, you know, People mention um, you get skeletal muscle weakness, which may decrease ventilation. Obviously, not a um, issue when someone is intubated and paralyzed, but this is um, something that you know you need to consider if uh, they're not. Um, and then GIT, you know, very common, nausea, vomiting, may also have hepatitis, yeah, tissue and necrosis with extravasation. Let's go on to the second question. So second question is, describe the physiological basis of methods used prevent hypoxemia prior to intubation in a RSI. And then after that, we want you to describe the adverse effects. So I can tell you what's the easier one to answer. This bit here, the physiological basis of methods used to prevent hypoxemia, people would really just focus on the physiological basis. What they would struggle in, the methods used to prevent hypoxemia, and they would struggle with the adverse effects. So the natural inclination of how a candidate who would look at this answer, they would go, I've got a lot of knowledge on the physiological basis of hypoxemia. So they would spend a core of their answer describing this, about one line describing the methods, and probably a couple of words describing the adverse effects, which would lead to a below par mark. Having a question like this, what I do is I, I divide it. I, I would spend five minutes on the physiological basis and five minutes on the methods um, and the adverse effects, all right? So let me show you what I would do. This is probably where you start with you know, a nice 
easy definition. What's the definition of hypoxemia? Uh, PaO2 less than or equal to 60 millimetres of mercury. Yep. Okay, the second thing is, what's the aim of pre-oxygenation? Increase your safe apnea time. Excellent. Okay. Increase safe apnea time. When we think about increasing safe apnea time, we're looking at increasing O2 stores. And where are our stores of O2? Primarily the FRC. Excellent. FRC. Yep. But also bound to haemoglobin. Blood. Excellent. Um, there's one more, but I can't, it's just left my brain. In the muscles of so, myoglobin? Yeah, yep. correct. So blood is both haemoglobin and dissolved, and then myoglobin. So your aim is to increase oxygen stores in FRC blood, which consists of uh, hemoglobin dissolved and myoglobin. The next thing to note is that your normal oxygen consumption at rest, what's that in mils per kilo per minute? Three to four? Yeah, let's see. Three and a half mils per kilo per minute. So the next bit is, what's FRC normally in mils per kilo? 30 yeah. mils per kilo. It's 30 mils per kilo. What's the difference with the safe apnea time with air versus 100% oxygen? It goes from like 40 seconds to six and a half minutes. Yeah. Kind of so it provides approximately 30 seconds of safe apnea time with air. So FiO2 0.21 versus seven minutes with FiO2 of 1.0. So what you're trying to describe is that the methods that you are going to talk about next is all aimed primarily at improving and maintaining your oxygen store at FRC. There is a method in terms of how you calculate this. Do you know how they come up with these numbers? I actually wrote out the alveolar gas equation in my answer and then showed where the numbers came from, which Good. is quite time consuming. But Excellent. I felt yeah. when I read the examiner's report that it was actually something that they wanted. I was going to ask yep. you, Sam, what you thought about that because yeah. Yeah, whether the money's in just stating it, um, the facts, or going through the process of proving it with you know, the various equations, which is, as you said, quite time consuming. I'll tell you why it's complicated. So FRC reserved with air. FiO2 equals 0 0.21. FRC is 30 mils per kilo. O2 consumption is 3.5 mils per kilo per minute. So your alveolar gas equation is PO2 equals FiO2 multiplied by your um, barometric pressure minus 47 minus PaCO2 over 0 0.8. With an FiO2 of 0.21, what does that normally equal out to? About 100. Yeah, yeah, about 100. If I was to ask you, at 100 millimeters of mercury, what's the fraction of O2 at FRC? So I have this as 100 over 760, which is your atmospheric pressure. So it's 0 0.13, and then you times it by the volume of FRC, which is 2,100, which gives you... 250 or something, which is a minute. Yeah, but it's not because what you're assuming is that you're able to use all that 250 mils of oxygen in FRC. Yeah, I, I do it differently because I take away 60 millimetres of mercury because we say hypoxia Correct. occurs at 60. Correct. So you do 100 minus, like 100 over um, 760 times 2100 minus 60 over 760 times 2,100. Yeah, correct. The other way to tell thing about it is the fraction at hypoxemia is 0 0.08 and your FRC reserve equals 30 mils per kilo times 1.5 equals 1 1.5 mils per kilo. And essentially it's 1.5 divided by 3.5, which is your oxygen consumption and that gives you 0 0.43, which is approximately about 25 seconds. The problem with doing this is that you need to explain this again for- For 100%. Imagine writing all this down and then repeating it again for FRC reserve with oxygen. I've done this numerous times and even at 10 minutes, I would be pushing it. If you can't get out in 10 minutes, then we have, we have no chance. What I think would be a better way to do it would be to write down the alveolar gas equation for air. This bit here, what I would do is, I would say it's based on your alveolar gas equation with 
FiO2 of 0.21, it equals an oxygen store of 0.13 times 30 mils per kilo versus um, FiO2 of 1.0 would equal about 0.87 times 30 mils per kilo of oxygen of O2 store. And that's about as detailed as I put. The reason why is we still have so much more to discuss. Remember the next bit you need to discuss is oxygen content in blood. And then you've got to write the formula, which is HB times 1.34 times O2 sets plus PaO2 times 0 0.003. So, so if you would run 100% oxygen, only increases content by two mils per deciliter. That's a key thing to know. If you do the calculations, it doesn't actually give you an appreciable amount of time. The bang for your buck is actually just with FRC. Now, you've covered the physiological basis, definition, a description of the aims, which is the safe apnea time. So definition, safe apnea time, where the stores are, that they'll give you another mark. Knowing about the oxygen consumption at rest, talking about FRC and the difference in time based on the alveolar gas equation. And then after that, the content in blood. You've got the formula here, and then you've got the concept that it only increases content by two mils. So I can tell you that in itself is five marks there. That's half the question answered. And what you want to do next now is you want to talk about the adverse effect of the methods. So adverse effects. I think someone talked about apneic oxygenation. If you were to run, you know, nasal cannulas or high flow nasal cannulas in all your patients, what's the potential downside to it? The face mask won't seal properly. Yeah. So it's going to affect the seal of your face mask. All right. So what's another method that we often use to prevent hypoxemia or to improve pre-oxygenation? Head up. Yep. Good. So position. What's the side effect of that? Limited cerebral perfusion, if you're worried about. Good. Excellent. So hypotension. It's not suitable with C-spine patients. The morbidly obese patients, they're often very upright. We often put them very, very upright. And that can often actually make the airway more difficult to manage. So it actually may increase difficulty of intubation. All right. What's the third thing that we can do for pre -oxygenation? PEEP? Yeah, PEEP. Good. And what's the risk of PEEP or, or CPAP? Decreased penis return. Good. Excellent. So decrease venous return and also you actually increase the risk of aspiration if patient vomits. Because remember that with people see that you're, you're pushing air in. Okay. So if, so if they vomit, you're going to be pushing that whatever they vomit back in. And then what kind of um, FIO2s do we normally run at with pre -oxygenation? We often run 100%. at FIO2. 100%. Yeah, 100%. What's, what's the adverse effect of running 100%? Absorption atelectasis. Yeah, absorption atelectasis. What else? Who would you avoid 100% oxygen in? Neonates. Yeah, neonates. So you get retinopathy or prematurity. Yep. Good. Anything else? Bleomycin. Yeah, bleomycin. Um, and then there's also that, that potential where um, it can cause coronary vasoconstriction. So, you know, you know, we try to avoid high FIO2s in patients who've had um, ischemic, recent ischemic events. So not desirable in patients with recent uh, post ischemic event. And then, you know, the fifth one, I put something like eight deep breaths in 60 seconds. The adverse effects of that are you get hyperventilation or hypopapnia, not suitable agitated patients. So you can see like, you know, for this question here, a lot of us would spend a lot of time on this and very few would actually spend much time on this and this. But a complete answer, you need to make sure that you've got all this and you've got to balance that with being able to talk about the physiological basis, which is definition, aims, as well as the, you know, the formulas that are involved as well. So the next question is draw the O2 HB and CO2 HB association curves on the same axis, partial pressure versus content, compare and contrast these two curves. All right, so you get a question like this, you panic because how many times have we seen an O2 HB and CO2 dissociation curve on the same axis? Have you guys ever seen it? When I did this question, I had to look in so many textbooks just to try and find one. I think there's one hidden away in West in the new edition somewhere. Yeah, it's not easy at all to find. So what I would do is I will leave a page blank. And when it talks about compare and contrast, what's the kind of format that we often like to put? Table. Yeah, table. Okay. So what I would do is I would leave a page empty and then I would go straight to my table of my O2 curve and my CO2 curve. Couple of things are I'm gonna have 
arterial point and what my venous point is. Because remember, when you've got two dots, you can pretty much draw a line. So what's our arterial point for the oxygen curve? What's a normal PaO2 in arterial blood? 100. Yeah, 100. Excellent. And at 100, what is your oxygen content? Depends on your HP, but 18 or... No, normally we say about 20, just to make it nice and easy. What's your venous partial pressure for oxygen? 40. 40, good. And what's the content at 40? It's like 15. Yeah, 15, correct. All right, for your CO2 curve, what's the arterial CO2? 45. Uh, that's probably more venous. Normally arterial CO2 is often about 40. Venous will be about 45, 46, we'll say. So unfortunately, you know, these are sort of numbers that you, you need to know. But you can see that by knowing these numbers, it allows you immediately to be able to draw the diagram. And I'll show you how. So what I would do is draw my curve. Um, I need to be at 100 here. So I can go 50, 75, 25. And that is O2 or CO2 partial pressure. And this is millimeters of mercury. And after that, I need to be at content 60, 30, uh, in the middle, I would say 40, 50, 20, 10. So for O2, CO2 content. First one we're going to draw is the HBO2 dissociation curve. So we've got two points, 120 and 40 and 15. So we go back and we go 120 and 40 and 15. Okay, so that's A and that's B. And what's the shape of the curve? Sigmoid. Sigmoid. Yeah, sigmoid. So we know it's a sigmoid shaped curve. So we draw a sigmoid shaped curve. And then after that, you've got the other two points, which is 40 and 48 and 46 and 52. So 40 and 48 is here, 46 and 52. We'll say it's up here. All right, so you move from here to here. So this is A and this is V. Now, a CO2 dissociation curve, it shifts because of what effect? Haldane effect? Yeah, it shifts because of the Haldane effect. So the CO2 curve is not just, remember that you actually have to draw two CO2 curves. And the, and the CO2 curves, you know, you, you know, you've seen the CO2 curves. So you've got one CO2 curve at 97% and another CO2 curve at 75%. Okay, so this is your CO2 curve and this is your O2 curve. And then after that, what you go back is you go back to your little table and then you have to think about the carriage. How's oxygen normally carried? Hemoglobin. Yeah, what's the formula that we can use? Content formula. Correct. Oxygen is carried in hemoglobin, which is 1.36, which is Huffner's constant, multiplied by HB, multiplied by SO2. And then how else is it carried? So HBN? Dissolved. Dissolved. Excellent. So again, 0 0.003 using Henry's solubility coefficient. All right, you write that down times PaO2. Just as an aside, you see how I've used 0 0.003? <clears throat> Sometimes you see 0 0.03. What's the difference between using 0 0.003 and 0 0.03? The deciliter of blood versus the liter of blood. Good. So when I go 0 0.003, what, what am I using? A uh, deciliter. Correct. So 0 0.003 represents mils per deciliter. Okay. If you see 0 0.03, it's representing mils per liter. All right. How is CO2 carried? Uh, bicarb, carb amino compounds and dissolved. Good. Good. So the arterial is 5% dissolved, 90% bicarb and 5% carb amino. And remember that when we talk about the venous arterial difference, we're not talking about venous carriage. We're talking about what accounts for the difference you see in venous versus arterial carriage. So what accounts for the venous arterial difference is 10% dissolved, 60% bicarb, and 30% as carb amino. Number four, I'll talk about the shape. Shape's very easy. You've got sigmoid versus curve linear. What's the advantage of the flat part of the curve? Or the steep part of the curve? So the flat part at the top means you can have changes in your PaO2 without significant drop in your oxygen saturation. So yep. flat upper portion favours oxygen loading in pulmonary capillary. So the steep part of the curve favours O2 unloading in the tissues. The fifth bit is modification. So, you know, you talk about the Bohr effect versus the um, aldane increases in H plus PCO2, 2,3, TPG, and temp. Where does that move the curve? Right. 
And then uh, with the Haldane effect, a reduction in saturations shifts the curve to the left and helps improve uh, CO2 carriage. So I'll just show you here. So with a reduction in saturation, you get a shift of the curve to the left and it helps improve CO2 carriage. And in fact, about 50% of CO2 carriage is due to the Haldane effect. We'll go through the next question. Define and describe lung compliance and discuss the difference between static and dynamic compliance. All right, when we have a definition for lung compliance, what's, what's the definition for compliance? Change in volume for a given change in pressure. Yeah, good. So change in volume for a given change in pressure. And what are some normal values that you know about? So for lung compliance, it's 200 mils uh, per centimeter of water. Yeah. So you see different values depending on what textbooks you read, but 150 to 200 mils per centimeter. Why, why is it low for, for a patient under anesthesia when you're measuring on your anesthetic machine? Because it's a dynamic compliance that it's measuring. Yes. Good. One, it's dynamic. And I think under GA, you're um, already lost to like 20% of your FRC. Yeah, good. So you, you do get reduced compliance under anesthesia. The other big thing is that when you are measuring it on an anesthetic machine, what kind of compliance are you measuring? It includes the chest wall compliance, I think. Correct. The, really the big difference is that you're measuring total respiratory lung compliance. And this 150 to 200 is really an isolated lung. The formula for total compliance equals one over the compliance of the lung plus one over chest wall compliance. What's normal chest wall compliance? It's also about 200. Yeah, sort of 150 to 200. If I was to say the lung compliance is 150 and the chest wall is also 150, what would be your total compliance be? 75. Yeah, correct. So your total compliance would be two over 150, which is approximately 75. So I want you guys to actually see that number. Total respiratory lung compliance, when you include both lung and chest wall is actually a lot less than what you see in, in terms of the numbers. And the reason for that is because of this relationship here. So in actual fact, when you actually look at the anesthetic machine and in terms of the compliance that you calculate on your anesthetic machine, when you look at the change in volume for a given change in pressure, you will note that probably a lot closer to this number than in the 150 to 200. Now we need definitions of static and dynamic compliance. So what definitions do you have for static and dynamic compliance from, from your respiratory tutorial? So static compliance would be the total compliance when all alveoli are at equilibrium with the atmosphere or the external environment and in, in the absence of airflow. Very good. That's mine. And again, remember that I always think about it in terms of brevity. All these concepts, you, you do need to think about it in terms of being able to reproduce them at, in the shortest amount of time. Kaz, what's your definition of dynamic compliance? Uh, so the definition I have here is the instantaneous total compliance measure during the respiratory cycle without the cessation of airflow. Um, so I guess it's the it's taking the compliance and accounting for airflow at the same time. I actually know what you mean, and it's 100% correct. But I, I, you know, I want you to go back, try to cut it back so that it's about one one or two lines. So that dynamic compliance is, is basically the change in change in volume and change in pressure when no gas flow is occurring. And essentially it's just two points. What are the two points? The, the two points are basically end inspiratory. End expiration and yeah, end correct. expiration. Yeah, that's right. The end inspiratory and end expiratory points. Okay. So now we've defined and we've described lung compliance. The next thing that we need to do is we do need to draw curves. When we look at a, a static compliance curve, what does the curve often look like? It displays hysteresis. Yeah, so it looks like this. Now, what does a dynamic compliance curve looks like? Similar, but less in volume, less high. Yeah, you see them often run at tighter volume. What you often see is you often see a curve that looks like this. Remember that when we look at the static compliance curve, we're looking at the total lung volume. So this is all TLC and that will often, you can go up higher, but tends to be at tighter volume. So the question is what causes the difference between the dynamic compliance versus static compliance. It's the slow alveoli. For which one? Uh, for dynamic. So you're looking at the different time constants. When we talk about time constants, I just want you guys to really know about time constants. So a time constant is the time required to 
63.2% completion or one over one over E. Or the other definition is, is the time to re required to reach completion if the initial rate of change were maintained or compliance times resistance. You don't need to know this. A time constant, it's mathematically derived. If you look at the exponential function, and if you go back to sort of pharmacokinetics, time constant is one over K. We also know that the formula, you know, Ohm's law V equals I times R. If I was to pop that around, I bought I equals V over R. And remember that I equals flow, flow equals current, and then V is pressure. So flow equals pressure over resistance. And remember that you can also uh, define flow in terms of change in volume for a, for a given change in time equals P over R. Now, we also talked about compliance and how compliance equals the change in volume for a given change in pressure. So we can actually redefine uh, compliance as pressure equals volume divided by compliance. What we can do is substitute this into here. So what you get is your negative V over DT over V over C times R. And what you do is that you integrate it. You get V over E minus T over C times R. And remember that a time constant equals one over K. So one over K here is C times R. Or other words, a time constant equals compliance times resistance. So if you had something with that was a fast alveoli, it must have low compliance and low resistance. Low resistance, exactly. And a slow alveoli has high resistance and high compliance. What's the worst kind of alveoli that you can have? High resistance, low compliance. High resistance and, and low compliance. And the best kind of alveoli that you can have is something with low resistance, high compliance. When we look at time constants, you can see that even if you have something that's a really bad alveoli, it might actually have the same time constants as something that has the most desirable alveoli. And actually, fact, when we talk about fast and slow alveoli, actually have some good points about them. So the fast alveoli actually has low resistance, but the negative is it's got low compliance. Whereas the slow alveoli, it's got high resistance, which is the negative, but the positive is good compliance. So when we talk about time constants is that we're just talking about heterogeneous lung units which behave very differently so when we talk about the difference between static compliance and dynamic compliance the distribution of gas is one factor with the distribution of gas what you'll see is that if you actually change your inspiratory rate so your ie ratios what you'll find is that your compliance actually improves you have an ie ratio often it's set to one to two what i want you to do is when you go back you have to be on volume control ventilation to actually do this have an appropriate tidal volume so let's say 500 mils in an average person set the ie ratio to one to two initially look at what the peak pressure is all right and then what i want you to do is i want you to change your ie ratio to one to one when you change to one to one your peak pressure actually decreases so if you change your ie ratio to one to one remember that your inspiratory time actually increases so if you have a short inspiratory time, what you'll often see is more fast alveoli. And that's why your compliance drops as your IE ratio um, reduces. Okay. So as you increase your inspiratory time, you see your peak pressures drop. As you decrease your inspiratory time, you see your peak pressures increase. Now, what are some of the other factors that affect dynamic compliance? Respiratory rate. So respiratory rate has to do with the distribution of gas. Because remember that as you increase your respiratory rate, you actually decrease your inspiratory time. And as you reduce your respiratory rate, you actually increase your inspiratory time. So respiratory rate is also a factor in terms of distribution of gas. So that's the other thing that you can do is that as you reduce your respiratory rate, you'll actually see your peak pressures reduce. So that, that is part of it. Yes. Anything else? Airway resistance. Airways resistance. Yeah, good. The really big thing about dynamic compliance is that it includes airways resistance. When we talk about the dynamic compliance curve, this bit here is airways resistance. Whereas you don't get that when you're measuring static compliance. Because you're at steady state and because there's no flow of air, airways resistance is negligible. You see a component, some textbook, where they've got like another little small little... Do you know what this bit here is? I haven't seen that before, Stan. You haven't seen it before? All right. I'll just quickly run through this with you guys. So worker breathing is the change in pressure and the change in volume and needed to overcome both elastic and non-elastic resistance. Non-elastic resistance consists of both airways resistance and viscoelastic resistance. So remember that with dynamic compliance, it includes both 
elastic resistance and non-elastic resistance. And this is the graph from Wes that you'll often see. So the shaded area represents airways resistance as well as the viscoelastic resistance. So you see a diagram like this, and this is in Ganong. The dark blue shaded area here represents airways resistance, and this area here represents tissue resistance. Remember that lung is, it's not a true elastic body, it's what we call a viscoelastic body. If you look at the difference between a viscoelastic body and an elastic body, a true elastic body is that when you stretch it, all the potential energy that you generate stretching it is able to be released for a counter force. Whereas a viscoelastic, it has a property where Yes, when you stretch it, it does have potential energy to come back, but there's some resistance to it when you stretch it. So you see in some textbooks that when we talk about worker breathing needed to overcome non-elastic resistance, you see that airways resistance is a major component, but you'll also see some texts allude to an idea called viscoelastic resistance. And in fact, if you actually read in nuns, they talk about viscoelastic resistance and they talk about how you can actually measure viscoelastic resistance with your anesthetic machines. When we talk about the elastic forces, so note that when I drew elastic forces, I drew it pretty much like this, like a triangle. This is from Power and Cam. A bit annoying that he's drawn it the other way around, but this is how he's drawn it. This is again is, is Ganong. So with Ganong, his elastic resistance is a triangle as well. But you see from Wes that it's a rhomboid shape. Why is that? Has it got something to do with Wes is like pure physiologist and it might be an isolated lung? Yeah, correct. So remember that Wes, when he does his work, this is just a pure lung because what's the opposite that counteracts this? Chest wall. Chest wall, exactly. So I'll just show you what it sort of looks like. So you'll see this diagram in nuns, and I think you'll see it in West too, but essentially what West does is, this is the lung compliance. And as you can see, if you look at the elastic work, it's a rhomboid shape. Whereas if you have both total respiratory and lung, which includes both lung and chest wall, it's actually a triangle. You see this bit here? Triangle versus rhomboid. So with the factors affecting dynamic compliance, airways resistance, viscoelastic resistance, got distribution of gas, which is fast versus slow alveoli. You know, if you read nuns, and there's a section on, you know, time dependence of pulmonary elastic behavior, they talk about the difference between the inspiratory and expiratory phase due to recruitment of alveoli during inspiration which then leads to an increase in compliance during expiration. This one's a small point. These are probably the big three. This one here is just a small point. Point it out there just, just in case you read it and want to know how to contextualize that knowledge. So with the factors affecting static compliance, I think Annie, you said lung volume. So with lung volume, you know, there's both regional and whole lung volume. You can draw your compliance curve. You can draw your lung. So with regional lung volume, where's the greatest compliance? at FRC. Bottom? Yeah. So bottom has the greatest compliance at FRC and the top functions uh, at the top. Okay. With compliance at FRC, faces more than apex. And then with whole lung volume, the bigger your lung is, is it less or more compliant as your lung gets bigger? In other words, who has more compliance, an adult or a neonate? Adult. Adult. But how do we standardize size? So specific. Yeah, specific compliance. Okay, so specific compliance is dividing it by FRC, and that really tells you about the intrinsic properties of the lung, and that should often be the same. The other thing that affects static compliance, which is often a big thing, is surfactant activity, okay, with reference to surface tension. Surfactant activity changes two ways. So it changes with both the lung volumes and it changes with both the respiratory cycle. So with lung volumes, where is the fact that activity is greater? Low, low, low lung volumes, correct. So at low lung volumes, surfactant activity increases. Why is it important that surfactant activity increases at low lung volume? You'd get very high pressure. High pressure, yeah. And then what does that lead to? To collapse of the small alveolar. Yeah, correct. So what happens is that, remember that pressure always moves from an area of high to low. If you go to Laplace's law where pressure equals two times 
thickness. We don't worry about thickness because it's so thin times surface tension divided by your radius. So as you can see, as your radius decreases, if you don't have a change in surface tension, your pressure increases. And if you think about it, this is what they call the, the pendulum effect. So if you have a small alveoli, the pressure in here increases. And what it does is it moves that air into here, leading to airway collapse. But what happens is that because of surfactant activity, your surface tension actually decreases proportionately a lot more than the radius. And so your pressure actually drops. And so the reverse happens now you get movement of air from here to here and so you get these small alveoli being maintained the other thing that you note with surfactant is that its activity is greater during expiration than inspiration and there's a couple of theories behind of, of why this happens it's quite complex no one really understands it you know they, they talk about a mono versus multi multi-layer process but what this says is that during the expiration phase this is more compliant than the inspiration so this is inspiration this is expiration that the compliance during expiration is more than the compliance during inspiration because of the changing nature of uh, surfactant. And in actual fact, what does this describe? Hysteresis. Hysteresis, exactly. It's often ascribed that hysteresis is because the lung is an elastic body. But remember what I said, the lung is not a true elastic body, it's a viscoelastic body. Okay. And part of hysteresis is the changing nature of surfactant. In actual fact, it is actually surfactant that plays a major role in hysteresis. <laughs>